Hence, there is a great deal in the spiritual and unspiritual currents of the present time, of which men should be acutely aware and determine their attitude of soul accordingly. Upon the ability and willingness to penetrate to the roots of such matters will depend the effect which the incarnation of Araman can have upon men, whether this incarnation will lead them to prevent the earth from reaching its goal or bring home to them the very limited significance of intellectual unspiritual life. If men rightly take in hand the currents leading toward Araman, then simply through his incarnation in earthly life they will recognize the Aramanic influence on the one side and on the other its polar opposite, the Luciferic influence. And then the very contrast between the Aramanic and the Luciferic will enable them to perceive the third reality. Men must consciously wrestle through to an understanding of this trinity of the Christian impulse, the Aramanic and the Luciferic influences. For without this consciousness, they will not be able to go forward into the future with the prospect of achieving the goal of earth existence. Spiritual science must be taken in deep earnestness, for only so can it be rightly understood. It is not the outcome of any sectarian whim, but something that has proceeded from the fundamental needs of human evolution. Those who recognize these needs cannot choose between whether they will or will not endeavor to foster spiritual science. On the contrary, they will say to themselves, the whole physical and spiritual life of men must be illumined and pervaded by the conceptions of spiritual science. Just as once in the East there was a Lucifer incarnation, and then at the midpoint, as it were, of world evolution, the incarnation of Christ, so in the West there will be an incarnation of Araman. This Aramanic incarnation cannot be averted. It is inevitable, for men must confront Araman face to face. He will be the individuality by whom it will be made clear to men what indescribable cleverness can be developed if they call to their help all that earthly forces can do to enhance cleverness and ingenuity. In the catastrophes that will befall humanity in the near future, men will become extremely inventive. Many things discovered in the forces and substances of the universe will be used to provide nourishment for man. But these very discoveries will at the same time make it apparent that matter is connected with the organs of intellect, not with the organs of the spirit, but of the intellect. People will learn to eat and drink in order to become really clever. Eating and drinking cannot make them spiritual, but clever and astute, yes. Men have no knowledge of these things as yet, but not only will they be striven for, they will be the inevitable outcome of catastrophes looming in the near future. And certain secret societies where preparations are, are already in train will apply these things in such a way that the necessary conditions can be established for an actual incarnation of Araman on the earth. This incarnation cannot be averted, for men must realize during the time of the earth's existence just how much can proceed from purely material processes. He must learn to bring under his control those spiritual or unspiritual currents which are leading to Araman. Once it is realized that conflicting party programs can be proved equally correct, our attitude of soul will be that we do not set out to prove things, but rather to experience them. For to experience a thing is a very different matter from attempting to prove it intellectually. Equally, we shall be convinced that deeper and deeper penetration of the Gospels is necessary through spiritual science. The literal word-for-word -word acceptance of the Gospels that is still so prevalent today promotes Aramanic culture. Even on external grounds, it is obvious that a strictly literal acceptance of the Gospels is unjustified. For as you know, what is good and right for one time is not right for every other time. What is right for one epoch 
becomes luciferic or aramanic when practiced in a later one. The mere reading of the Gospel text has had its day. What is essential now is to acquire a spiritual understanding of the mystery of Golgotha in the light of the truths enshrined in the Gospels. Many people, of course, find these things disquieting, but those whose interest is attracted by anthroposophy must learn to realize that the levels of culture gradually piling one above the other have created chaos and that light must penetrate again into this chaos. It is interesting that such things happen every now and again. In 1912, a science called eugenics was established in London. People tend to use highfalutin names for anything which is particularly stupid. The ideas you find in eugenics really came from people's brains and not from their souls. What are the aims of this science? To ensure that only healthy individuals are born in future and not inferior ones. Economics and anthropology are to join forces to discover the laws according to which men and women are to be brought together in such a way that a strong race is produced. People are really beginning to think in this way. The ideal of the London Congress, which was chaired by Darwin's son, was to examine people of different classes to see how large the skulls of the rich were compared to those of the poor, who have less opportunity for learning, how far sensibility went in rich and poor, how far the rich could resist getting tired, and how far the poor would do so, and so on. They want to gain information on the human body in this way, which may at some future date enable them to establish exactly the following. This is how the man should look, this is how the hu woman should look, if they are to produce the true human being of the future. He should have such a capacity for getting tired, and she such a capacity. This size skull for him, and a matching size for her, and so on. Those are the rumblings, natural rumblings, in brains which are emptied of soul. Ideas rumbling about which had reality in the Atlantean age. Then there really were laws which enabled people to determine size, growth, and all kinds of things by cross-breeding and the like. It was a science that was widespread in Atlantean times, and as I mentioned yesterday, sorely misused. Atlantean science worked on the basis of physical relationships, and it was known that if such a man was brought together with such a woman, differences between men and women were much greater at the time, the result would be such and such a creature, and then a different variety could be produced, just as plant breeders do today. The mysteries brought order into this cross-breeding, where related and different elements were brought together. They established groups and withdrew anything which had to be withdrawn from humanity. The blackest of black magic was practiced in Atlantean times, and order was created by establishing classes and taking these matters out of human control. This was one of the factors which led to the nations and races of today. The issue of the nation as an entity is coming up again in our present time. It is an echo of the soulless brain from Atlantean times. Individuals differ much more from each other than one thinks, for the human soul no longer relates entirely to the body and this makes human beings very complex today. This, of course, has other consequences, though the matter is dealt with rather clumsily today. We must hope that anthroposophy will help people become less clumsy about it. Just consider, in ancient Greece the whole body was filled with the whole soul, and they were in agreement. Today this is not the case, for the bodies are partly empty. I'm not saying anything derogatory about empty heads. They will stay empty as part of evolution. In reality, however, nothing stays empty in this world. The heads are merely empty of something which was destined to fill them at another time. Nothing is ever completely empty. With the human soul withdrawing more and more from the body, the body is increasingly in danger of being filled with something else. And if human beings are not prepared to take up impulses which can only come from spiritual knowledge, 
the body will be filled with demonic powers. Humanity is facing a destiny where the body may be filled with aramonic, demonic powers. So we have to add to what I said yesterday about future development. There will be people in future who are you know, Tom, Dick and Harry in ordinary life, which is something determined by social circumstances. But their bodies will be empty to such an extent that a powerful aramonic spirit can live in them. One will be meeting aramonic demons. Human beings will not be what they appear to be. The individual person will be deep down inside and outwardly one will get a totally different picture. This shows the complexity of life to come. It is reasonable to say that there will be situations in future when it will be difficult to know who one is dealing with. Ricardo Huch's longing for the devil really arises from what will be coming in the future. The institutions and ideas, especially the social ideas people have today, are abstract and crude. They are clumsy in the face of the complexities that are lying ahead. And because people are not able to have ideas or concepts about the true nature of things, they are sliding more and more deeply into chaos. The events of the war make this quite clear. Chaos is arising because reality has changed. Reality is becoming fuller and richer than anything people are able to think of or create in their heads. And we shall have to be clear in our minds that we are faced with a choice. To go on beating each other to a pulp, shooting at one another in the way we do now, because we do not know how to bring order into the world, or start to develop concepts and ideas to match the complexity of the situation. A spiritual movement must exist where people seek to develop concepts which meet the real situation. There will be vast numbers of people in future who want to stick to the rumblings of the past. Today they are still in the minority. Their concepts, ideas and actions will be based on the outside world around them and on the fact that their bodies are being filled with the aramonic spirit which wants them to form such ideas. We should not fool ourselves, for we are, for we are faced with a quite specific movement. At the Council of Constantinople it was decreed that the spirit did not exist. It was dogmatically stated that the human being consisted only of body and soul, and it was heresy to speak of a human spirit. In the same way, attempts will be made to decree the soul, the inner life, as non-existent. The time will come, and it may not be far off, when quite different tendencies will come up at a congress like the one held in 1912, and people will say, it is pathological for people to even think in terms of spirit and soul. Sound, in quotes, people will speak of nothing but the body. It will be considered a sign of illness for anyone to arrive at the idea of any such thing as a spirit or a soul. People who think like that will be considered to be sick, and you can be quite sure of it, a medicine will be found for this. At Constantinople the spirit was made non-existent. The soul will be made non-existent with the aid of a drug. Taking a, quote, sound point of view, close quote, people will invent a vaccine to influence the organism as early as possible, preferably as soon as it is born, so that this human body never even gets the idea that there is a soul and a spirit. The two philosophies of life will be in complete opposition. One movement will need to reflect how concepts and ideas may be developed to meet the reality of soul and spirit. The others, the heirs of modern materialism, will look for the vaccine to make the body, in quotes, healthy, that is, makes its constitution such that this body no longer talks of such rubbish as soul and spirit, but takes a sound view of the forces which live in engines and in chemistry and let planets and suns arise from nebula in the cosmos. Materialistic physicians will be asked to drive the souls out of humanity. People who think that 
playful ideas will help them to look ahead to the future are very much mistaken. We need serious, profound ideas to look ahead to the future. Anthroposophy is not a game, not just a theory. It is a task that must be faced for the sake of human evolution. The end of Lecture 5 For that, it is essential above all to realize that wallowing in abstractions, however loud the cry for the spirit, is not yet spiritual, not yet spirit. Vague, abstract chattering about the spirit must never be confused with the active search for the content of the spiritual world pursued in anthroposophical science. Nowadays there is much talk about the spirit, but you who accept spiritual science should, mu should not be deluded by such chattering. You should perceive the difference between it and the descriptions of the spiritual world attempted in anthroposophy, where the spiritual world is described as objectively as the physical world. You should probe into these differences, reminding yourselves repeatedly that abstract talk of the spirit is a deviation from sincere striving for the spirit, and that by the very talk people are actually removing themselves from the spirit. Purely intellectual allusion to the spirit leads nowhere. What then is intelligence? What is the content of our human intelligence? I can best explain this in the following way. Imagine, and this will be better understood by the many ladies present, imagine yourself standing in front of a mirror and looking into it. The picture presented to you by the mirror is you, but it has no reality at all. It is nothing but a reflection. All the intelligence within your soul, all the intellectual content, is only a mirror image. It has no reality. And just as your reflected image is called into existence through the mirror, so what mirrors itself as intelligence is called into existence through the physical apparatus of your body, through the brain. Man is intelligent only because his body is there. And as little as you can touch yourself by stretching your hand toward your reflected image, as little can you lay hold of the spirit if you turn only to the intellectual, for the spirit is not there. What is grasped through the intellect, ingenious as it may be, never contains the spirit itself, but only a picture of the spirit. You cannot truly experience the spirit if you get no further than mere intelligence. The reason why intelligence is so seductive is that it yields a picture, a reflected picture of the spirit, but not the spirit itself. It seems unnecessary to go to the inconvenience of penetrating to the spirit because it is there, or so at least one imagines. In reality, it is only a reflected picture. But for all that, it is not difficult to talk about the spirit. To distinguish the mere picture from the reality, that is the task of the tenor of soul, which does not merely theorize about spiritual science, but has actual perception of the spirit. That is what I wanted to say to you today in order to intensify the earnestness which should pervade our whole attitude to the spiritual life as conceived by anthroposophy. For the evolution of humanity in the future, In 1798, an essay on the principle of population was written by Thomas Malthus. He outlined the idea of positive checks, which are diseases, wars, disasters, famines, and genocides. 
Malthus believed that these things should be utilized to increase the death rate and believed that human misery was an absolute necessary consequence. In 1859, Charles Darwin published The Origin of Species. In it, Darwin only hinted at the implications of human populations, but his cousin, Sir Francis Galton, became obsessed with the idea. In 1883, Galton published Inquiries into Human Faculty and its Development, wherein he wrote that his intention is to touch on various topics more or less connected with that of the cultivation of race, or, as we might call it, with eugenic. The term comes from the Greek word eugenis, of noble birth. In the early 20th century, eugenics became an academic discipline in universities. Organizations were formed and funded to win public support. The Kaiser Wilhelm Institute and the Cold Spring Harbor Institute rejected the idea that all humans are born equal and began selling the idea of cultivating a new master race of noble bloodlines. Planned Parenthood was formed in America by racial eugenics advocate Margaret Sanger. President of IBM, Thomas J. Watson, established a special subsidiary in Poland called Watson Business Machines to assist in the Nazi invasion of Poland. This business continued throughout the war and IBM managed the entire operation from their headquarters in New York. During the Nuremberg trials, the Nazis quoted U.S. Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes in their own defense. They claimed that their eugenics program was being run from the United States. The Nazis were rightly admonished for war crimes, but not Thomas Watson. He went on to create the IBM World Trade Corporation and passed IBM on to his son. His granddaughter ended up marrying Margaret Sanger's grandson. Bill Gates's father worked on the board for Planned Parenthood, and his mother worked on the corporate board for IBM, who Bill partnered with to create Microsoft. With no medical background, Bill Gates then went on to become the world's foremost pusher of vaccines and population control. Do you think this is all coincidence? The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation funds the WHO, the NIH, the CDC, and the UN. And now he is saying that until we get mass vaccinations, we might never be able to gather in groups. And which activities like mass gatherings uh, may be in a certain sense more optional. And so until you're widely vaccinated, those may not uh, come back uh, at all. The president's coronavirus response team are all pushing the Bill Gates vaccination agenda. Dr. Fauci is on the leadership council for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. In January of 2017, Anthony Fauci told a crowd at Georgetown University that there would be a surprise outbreak during the Trump presidency. There is no question that there will be a challenge to the coming administration in the arena of infectious diseases, both chronic infectious diseases in the sense of already ongoing disease, and we have certainly a large burden of that, but also there will be a surprise outbreak. Deborah Burks is a board member for the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria, which was founded by the Gates Foundation and known for millions of dollars of fraudulent misuse of funds. In October of 2019, Bill Gates sponsored Event 201, a simulation that estimated 65 million people killed by coronavirus. In November of 2019, the Peerbright Institute, funded by Bill Gates, was granted European patent number EP317-2319B1 for a coronavirus vaccine that may be used to treat humans. Today, Dr. Fauci says the virus will keep coming back, and he says the ultimate game changer will be a new vaccine. In Australia, the prime minister is telling people the shutdown will last months, that it's the new normal, and that the only way out of your homes is to accept the vaccine. There is no proof that vaccines are the answer. In fact, the CDC admitted in federal court that it does not have studies to support the claim that vaccines do not cause autism. A top UN scientist admitted 
that vaccines are killing people. It is time to do some hard thinking. Will you allow your government to impose forced vaccinations? called developers of Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine tied to UK eugenics movement. And like all of Whitney Webb's articles or co-authored articles, this one is voluminous and very detailed. So we will only scrape the surface today. I hope people will actually go and read the article itself. Having said that, let's bring her on. Whitney Webb, thank you for joining us today. Hey, absolutely. It's great to be here. All right. Uh, there are so many different things to go over with regards to this article, but I guess let's just start with that groundwork of the fact that not all COVID-19 vaccines are the same. They are different and operate on different principles. And as I say, the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine is not an mRNA shot. Tell us a little bit about the mechanism that this particular vaccine is employing. So this vaccine uses what uh, they describe as a chimpanzee adenovirus vector that they engineered to express the spike protein of COVID-19. And it was heavily promoted in, in contrast to the mRNA vaccines from Pfizer and Moderna, mainly because it doesn't have such complicated storage requirements, this cold supply chain. So it was being promoted basically as the vaccine of choice for developing countries because it doesn't require that type of logistical um, infrastructure. And that's actually why uh, the Gavi Vaccine Alliance has partnered with, uh, uh, you know, this partnership uh, to distribute uh, this particular vaccine to developing countries. Um, and uh, I don't know exactly how much detail you want me to go into the, the um, <coughs> like, me uh, mechanics of the, you know, the vaccine itself. But, you know, it, it's not, um, you know, as experimental, I guess you could say, as perhaps uh, Moderna and Pfizer's, which has never been licensed for use in humans before. But it, it is still experimental to a degree. And they had previously developed, uh, used the same vector for, I think, a MERS uh, vaccine. But of course, that was never put on the market either. But they've, you know, been a fiddling with this uh, particular, uh, you know, mechanism for, for a few years. Yes. And so it is important to stress, yes, this is a genetically modified chimpanzee adenovirus that they use as a vector mm -hmm. to get into, invade your cells, and then start producing the spike protein. So similar, I suppose, in the sense uh, to the mRNA, the ultimate par uh, uh, idea of this is to express that spike protein in order to stimulate the immune response. But it's a different way of doing it. And it is important to note that, as you say, it has at least been tried in humans before, unlike the mRNA experimental injections. But um, I, I, I do do bring that up because there are a number of implications of this, one of which, as you say, is that it doesn't require the cold storage that Pfizer or Moderna does. So it, it uh, as you say, this is the perfect uh, vaccine to give to the world at large, the de poor developing countries, the poor brown people around the world that obviously these big pharma manufacturers care so much about. And uh, this will be uh, not only that, it will also be distributed in a not-for-profit way. These companies aren't even, or Oxford AstraZeneca isn't even trying to make profit on it. As you point out, even the quote-unquote independent media, like your former employers over at Mint Press News, mm -hmm. successful not-for-profit Oxford COVID vaccine threatens big pharma profit logic. Oh, yay! But that's not quite the story here, is it? Tell us about this not-for-profit cover for this Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. Right. So that myth of the not per, for uh, uh, profit ethos of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine ignores the commercialized arm of the Oxford uh, Jenner Va Institute, which produced this vaccine and, you know, has some of the royalties on it. A lot of those royalties and the patents on the technology are actually held by a private company uh, by the two developers of the AstraZeneca or the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine that's called Vaxitech. And Vaxitech, um, their investors include Bravos Capital, set up by the former uh, top Deutsche Bank executive in England for equity trading during the 2008 economic crisis. It includes Google Ventures. It includes uh, the Wellcome Trust and also the UK government, all of whom stand to make some profit from that. It is true that um, the producers of the vaccine are going to get less, a small percentage of royalties currently until the pandemic is declared over. But once the pandemic is declared over and this you know, COVID-19 vaccination is, is set to become an annual event in subsequent uh, generations of the COVID-19 vaccine, this company, Vaxitech, is a, expected to drive uh, the second generation of COVID vaccines and expect to make a huge windfall of profits. And they've said this, that Vaxitech has been really open about this to their shareholders. So it's pretty amazing that even in the independent media, you know, that it, the Vax attack doesn't even get uh, hardly even a mention, uh, especially when you have people like Google and former Deutsche Bank executives um, essentially bankrolling them. Um, 
and standing to profit from the vaccine. And Google's ties to this um, are particularly significant because you have YouTube clamping down on COVID-19 vaccine misinformation um, at the same time that they, their venture capital arm has a stake in one of the vaccines. Exactly right. Okay, this is the point, part, uh, the part at which I think a, an infographic would be handy because there are a lot of different organizations here. But just on that note, before we move on, I will note that I did I did write about this in my year ahead part two biosecurity editorial from uh, January of this year, where I said that uh, one of the potential endpoints of the pandemic is June. Why June? Because that's when AstraZeneca says so. Uh, the deals uh, that the various big pharma drug pushers have made with governments around the world are by and large secret of course, because that's how the fascist corporate global cacistocracy rolls. But according to at least one such agreement that has been seen, but not shared, by the good old Financial Times, the document actually declares that the scamdemic will end on July 1st, 2021, unless, quote, AstraZeneca, acting in good faith, considers that the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic is not over. And I write, read the report for the details, but in a nutshell, AstraZeneca has agreed not to profit from their COVID vaccine until the pandemic is over, so they've had it written into their contracts that they get to declare the scandemic over by July. So uh, that's just one of the, the different rabbit holes here. So clearly there is some obfuscation of the actual profit motive that really is at play here, despite what you might be told, even in the quasi-independent media. But let's let's hone in on these different groups. I mean, you've just rattled out some names. How are these groups connected? We have Oxford, AstraZeneca, which itself is some sort of uh, agglomeration. And then there's there's the Vaxitech, there's the Wellcome Trust, there's Gavi, there's the Jenner Institute. Walk uh. us through this minefield <laughs> of different organizations. All right, well, let's start with the Jenner Institute because uh, they start, you know, they, they essentially develop this vaccine. So they were originally created in 1995 as um, a, pu- a public-private partnership between GlaxoSmithKline and the UK government. Uh, and then uh, in 2005, it was uh, moved, it was spun off and it was relaunched. Adrian Hill uh, was placed in charge. GlaxoSmithKline was taken off um, and it became a partnership between Oxford University and the Purbright Institute. Um, and since then, they've really tried to pres- position themselves as basically uh, the, the drivers of what vaccines are developed and what vaccine technologies are used to fight global pandemics. They've been doing this really ever since 2005, and they were actually really intimately involved in the 2014 Ebola crisis, the, um, where the vaccination effort there uh, mirrors what's happened with COVID-19 in, in remarkable ways. Um, actually, if you don't mind, there's a, a quote from The Guardian uh, from 2014 when that was going on, talking about a GlaxoSmithKline emergent biosolutions vaccine that the Jenner Institute was running the trials for, and they ran, you know, that the trials were very rushed and controversial at the time. But the way they talk about this vaccine in The Guardian, they say this um, human trials of GlaxoSmithKline's experimental vaccine are to be fast-tracked with funding by an international consortium. Vaccines normally take 10 years to develop, but uh, GlaxoSmithKline said it says it hopes to finish the first phases of trials by the end of 2014, four months after this article was written. Uh, it will start making up to 10,000 doses of the vaccine at the same time as initial clinical trials. So if they prove successful, stock will be immediately available to high risk communities. So that is basically almost word for word, you know, what we've heard about the marvel of the COVID-19 vaccination effort, but really this whole, uh, you know, situation in a lot of ways, including producing uh, tons of doses well before it's approved by any government. You know, all of that was uh, piloted in 2014. And it wasn't just GlaxoSmithKline and Emergent Biosolutions. It was also uh, the Fauci-led uh, NIAID uh, that was intimately involved in this. And they also, in the case of Oxford AstraZeneca's vaccine, have pumped $1 billion uh, into the production of this vaccine through BARDA. And actually, Fauci is one of the people that's promoted this idea that th- this is going to be an annual vaccination, which, of course, will allow Vaxitech and you know th- these uh, associated groups to, to profit massively. So... Um, talking about these GlaxoSmithKline ties, that's where the Wellcome Trust becomes relevant because the Wellcome Trust was originally uh, created in 1936 with money from Henry Wellcome. And Henry Wellcome uh, founded the company that went on to be GlaxoSmithKline. So it's really the philanthropic arm, you could argue, of of that particular uh, life sciences (laughs) pharmaceutical company. And, uh, okay, so I'm trying to get this all straight in my head. So uh, also there's the Oxford Vaccine Group. Is that a formal grouping? Yes. So the Jenner Institute is part of the Oxford Vaccine Group. 
And uh, one thing I did forget to mention is that Adrian Hill, while heading the Jenner Institute, is also part of the UK Vaccines Network, which is part of the UK government and determines where UK government money will go to fund in terms of um, vaccine technologies and public health preparedness, which is pretty much all vaccines, and of course has put tons of money into the Jenner Institute itself and a lot of its associated uh, institutes and uh, you know uh, other uh, uh, partner companies and things like that. Right. And as you go on to elaborate in the article, Adrian Hill was the lead developer of this particular vaccine. But uh, there's an interesting tidbit in here that I hadn't seen before that apparently Andrew Pollard, who works for the Jenner Institute and heads the Oxford Vaccine Group, quote, shared a taxi with a modeler who worked for the UK's scientific advisory group for emergencies. And during the taxi ride, the scientist told him data suggested that there was going to be a pandemic, not unlike the 1918 flu. This was apparently in January of 2020. And that's apparently why all this money was rushed into the development of this vaccine. And highly unlikely story, but uh, interesting. And one wonders the name of that modeler and whether it rhymes with Beale Bergeson or something along those lines. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, What a crazy tidbit. Yeah, it's definitely really telling because they were months ahead of this vaccine uh, before it was even a declared global, you know, crisis. And, you know, remember back to January 2020, most people were, were, you know, uh, talking about the Soleimani assassination and things like that. It wasn't really dominating attention. They decide to start pouring millions upon millions of dollars courting money from, you know, investors and different different groups like BARDA in the U.S. uh, for this particular uh, vaccine for the coronavirus because it was going to be like the 1918 flu according to this modeler tied with the SAGE group in the UK, which, uh, you know, uh, could have well been Neil Ferguson since he was the modeler of choice for that particular group at the time that argued for those lockdowns and is back again as sort of the architect behind uh, the creation of this new scary UK variant and things like that. So he definitely hasn't gone away uh, despite his controversies. Absolutely not, which is just ridiculous when you look at his track record. But anyway, uh, that's, I mean, that's pr- probably part of the point. So let's let's get into Adrian Hill and his connections and how that perhaps ties into this bigger story of eugenics links. Sure. Well, um, Adrian Hill has an interesting history. Uh, his uh, thesis is uh, one of his early bosses, who was also his uh, thesis advisor when he was a doctoral student, is a man named David Weatherall. Uh, who runs the, or who was, um, I believe it's called the Weatherall Institute for Molecular Genetics or something to that effect. Um, And he was actually a member of the Galton Institute and has spoken there several times. Adrian Hill himself actually spoke at the 2008 Galton Institute 100-year anniversary celebrating 100 years of the Galton Institute, which is kind of interesting since the Galton Institute superficially anyway tries to distance themselves from their eugenics past that we can get into in a moment. So if you're going to celebrate their 100-year legacy and not just their legacy from their rebranding in 1989, I think that is honestly pretty telling. Um, And um, as far as the eugenics tie go, uh, oh, sorry, uh, there's a little more I should say, too. On the governance board of the Galton Institute, you have one woman who used to work directly under Adrian Hill at the Wellcome Center for Human Genetics, and I believe another person who also worked there. uh, And that's also where the other co-developer of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, Sarah Gilbert, who's the co-founder um, a Vax attack was also connected to this Welcome Center for Human Genetics, where she was a program director. What's interesting about Adrian Hill is that he's been at that center, was involved with its founding, the Welcome Center for Human Genetics, for a very long time. There he is focused at the intersection of population genetics and race, particularly in Africa, um, doing various clinical trials there. They're currently doing clinic- clinical trials on 4,000 800 children for their experimental malaria vaccine uh, that was announced in December 2020. They have a history at the Jenner Institute of doing these trials on children. uh, And some of them have been really controversial with like several infants dying. I go in in more detail into uh, about this in the in the article. But um, the the Welcome Center for Human Genetics also just more broadly focuses at this intersection of of race and suscept- genetic susceptibility to diseases, uh, and that's uh, Hill's specialty is genetic susceptibility of diseases to um, uh, for severe respiratory illnesses, and he focuses specifically in Africa, which is where most of the Welcome Center stuff is focused. Uh, the Welcome uh, Trust, more broadly, is also the archivist for the UK Eugenic Society, which is the Galton Institute, and they have a lot of very um, uh, there's a lot of interconnected ties between them, but it's very telling, for example, when they opened their uh, archives on medical records at the Wellcome Trust, the first archive 
they sought to include in that uh, wasn't that of something like a, you know, a medical journal or something like that. It was, uh, you know, the Eugenic Society archives were what they wanted to archive first. And, you know, they describe the founder of eugenics, Francis Galton, um, not as a racist eugenicist, but uh, uh, the eminent 19th century polymath and things like this. Um, and are and are pretty, uh, you know, glowing in their description of of the man and his uh, pseudoscience. So, and uh, another interesting tidbit that you go into here is just um, in passing, you mention a scandal that the Welcome Sanger Institute specifically was involved in in Africa, <laughs> taking um, yeah. genetic information from Africans and finding a way to monetize that by creating gene chips that turned into sort of a minor scandal. And I, I, I must admit, I went down that rabbit hole looking for Welcome Sanger Institute. Why Sanger? It was founded by some some guy named Solston. Why is it called the Sanger? I was thinking maybe Margaret, but no, apparently Fred yeah. Sanger. But anyway, um, yeah, an interesting little rabbit hole and just shows that, yes, these wonderful uh, institutions that are just out there for philanthropy are also busily commoditizing the literal genetic data of Africans in order to essentially sell it back to them uh, at profit. Surprise, surprise. Just another example of the profit motive at work. But a deeper agenda, as you say, that hopefully my listeners will be well situated to already understand. If not, you could go back to episode 208 of the Corbett Report podcast on the Galton Institute Exposed. Uh, where it was revealed that the Galton Institute, what did it used to be called, Whitney? The Eugenic Society? Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. The, the Eugenic Society, named after, of course, the founder of the eugenics pseudoscience, Francis Galton. And of course, there are continues to be Galtons involved in the Galton Institute to this day. It's almost a family project, isn't it? Yeah, well, it's pretty amazing. There are other groups beside that that are also, you know, tied to this uh, older uh, phase of the eugenics movement that have rebranded recently, like Engender Health being one that's partnered with the Gates Foundation. They used to be, uh, be called, I believe, the Sterilization League for Human Betterment and are now Engender Health. Um, and funding, you know, birth control in, uh, you know, developing nations in Africa and South Asia with the Gates Foundation. So this rebranding is something that's happened uh, to a big extent. But the Galton Institute is really interesting because historically it was very enmeshed with British and also American uh, elite circles. And it really continues to be that way to a big degree. I mean, even if you go and look at the governance, it's very well placed professors and elite circles of academia in the UK. You have people from King College London, Imperial College, Oxford University, you know, the Welcome Centers, which are well-regarded and, and, and things like this, all, you know, all over its, its board. Even David J. Galton he teaches at a, at a prestigious university in London, uh, despite the fact that his most recent book is called Eugenics, the Future of Humanity for the 21st Century, where he talks about uh, thanks to the Human Genome Project, we have so many tools for DNA manipulation that now we can uh, genetically edit people for their betterment, uh, even without them, you know, knowing and for their public health and all of this stuff. And, you know, he's our, he uh, leaves it up to whether this should be compulsory by the state or left up to the individual. You know, I wonder what they'll choose. Um, and it's really interesting also that the Wellcome Trust actually recently funded a paper that essentially argued that as long as eugenics isn't coercive, it's acceptable policy. Um, so, I mean, this is something that these people still believe and they still advocate for. So the fact that this vaccine with these ties is being marketed specifically to developing countries, and that's the focus of these eugenicist linked people's research for decades, I mean, uh, it makes you kind of wonder, uh, and also the fact that they're getting this PR spin, uh, on top of it, that they're, you know, the, the good guys in the vaccine, uh, campaign and all of this is really uh, sick when you, you know, actually figure out what's going on. So I really hope some other uh, sites that have written to that effect will uh, reassess their conclusions, um, hopefully soon. One would certainly hope, given this information, documentable, as you say, and one that really did jump out at me in that rebranding. I mean, I've seen a lot of crypto-eugenic rebranding uh, in my work looking at this, but in gender health, yes, as you say, the Sterilization League for Human Bet Betterment becomes Engender Health. And it's funny, actually, I would invite people to go to the Wikipedia article on Engender Health to look at the way that they deal with this issue and kind of bury it down. Yeah, this used to be part of a eugenics thing, but now it's totally different, guys. Um, it, it's, it, it's the same thing every time. And Engender Health with USAID uh, and the Gates Foundation working on rebranding 
uh, Norplant as Jade L, which is one of those right. long acting uh, reversible contraceptives, aka birth control implants. In, yeah. yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Uh, that we know from the uh, Who is Bill Gates documentary. Bill Gates personally was very interested in that idea and also remote control, birth control technology, etc. So, as you say, there's no end to the links here. It, it, it's like a, a wheel with 8,000 different spokes and every one ends up at some eugenics-linked organization. But what would you say to the critics who counter, well, this is just six degrees of Kevin Bacon? I mean, yeah, okay, there's a connection here or he taught under, or he taught someone who had a connection there, but there's no direct link of eugenicists to this vaccine, is there? Well, you know, in 1968, the president of the American Eugenics Society said something to the effect of, uh, in the future, eugenics goals will be accomplished by something under a name different than eugenics. You look at the people that were involved in eugenics society in the past, people that were still very influential and praised and loved by the state today, people like Winston Churchill, uh, Margaret Sanger, John Maynard Keynes, were all part of what what is now the Galton Institute. Uh, it's not, it's no, it's it's never been reviled in UK polite society to be a member of this organization. It was rebranded and now it's listed as a charity and that has been allowed to continue. And the academics that are on its governing boards and advocate for these ideas um, are in prominent places in academia, rolled out as experts for things, including COVID-19 vaccine policy. Um, so to think, you know, and, and, and if you continue to, you know, Uh, Look at something like the Welcome Trust, which is very, since its, you know, foundation has pursued the same sort of policies, funded the same sort of things under different guises. You know, I I, I think it's... um, uh, their, their continued interest in archiving the eugenic society like there's uh, in, in describing it in, in, you know, neutral to positive terms um, is, is really alarming. And the fact that there was never accountability for this movement, it's been allowed uh, to change and, and rebrand. And that's the only way it could ever succeed, because obviously after World War II, uh, eugenics is not a popular uh, term anymore. And they were well aware of that and the need to go underground and uh, you know, uh, rebrand this as for our benefit and to get people to accept it. But it's really telling that in the era of COVID-19 vaccination, we've seen this push of sort of what I would call a uh, woke vaccine allocation policy, where they claim that this is needed to, uh, in the U.S. anyway, you know, to treat uh, systemic racism uh, and institutional racism by giving, you know, minorities the COVID-19 vaccine uh, first, but not giving them anything else. Uh, not subsidizing their health care, not giving them stimulus checks, uh, anything like that. Just the vaccine is the only thing that will somehow uh, uh, absol- uh, resolve longstanding problems, including police brutality. I mean, if you if you read the John Hopkins Center for Health Security uh, <laughs> COVID-19 vaccine policy document, I mean, they bring up the George Floyd protest as a reason to give African-Americans this vaccine first. Um, so w- when you look into the connections of, you know, their obsession with specifically African genetics at places like uh, the Jenner Institute and the Welcome Trust, um, the fact that they're, you know, associated with these societies that have been part of the aristocracy in the U.S. and the U.K. for a very long time. Um, you know, I think it's 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 a very compelling case to be made. It definitely warrants scrutiny, if nothing else. Um, you know, uh, and, you know, beyond that, you also have the case of the, uh, uh, in terms of vaccine allocation, they gave that in the U S the contract to Palantir, which is currently uh, predictive policing and locking up the very ethnic minorities that the COVID-19 vaccine is going to save. I mean, I mean, how many more pieces of evidence do you need? It's not like we're ever going to get affidavits from these people being like, yes, you have found us out. So when you're reporting on you know, either intelligence or these more secretive, uh, you know, movements like, you know, the eugenics movement, you're you're not going to get like the kind of, you know, concrete proof that some people expect. But I think there's definitely a compelling case to be made. Yes. And what you point out lines up so perfectly with what I've seen, for example, in my uh, research with the Gates Foundation and uh, the whistleblowers like Arata Koichi um, within the WHO malaria uh, department saying, look, the Gates Foundation is only interested in these medical pharmaceutical interventions, uh, expensive experimental technologies and other things, whereas just basic Um, uh, tools that we could be using and focusing our efforts on are being neglected. I wonder why that is. I mean, why are they going after this route rather than that route? And that could definitely be one part of this. And as you say, there are two extremely dark uh, signs of all of this. One is that 
the Oxford AstraZeneca is being t- touted as the vaccine for the the wider world and the the poor sustainable de- uh, development kind of countries, the countries that need our help. So we'll help them with this vaccine in particular. That should raise some alarm bells. And then uh, uh, secondarily, uh, uh, what was the other part of the war? <laughs> Dark ominous. Oh yes, as you say, there's uh, everyone connected with this vaccine has been saying all along. Oh, it looks like we're going to need one every year. It's not going to last very long, so we're going to have to make this an annual thing. Um, which again should raise concerns. And on a deeper fundamental level, it, uh, what is happening right now is a precedent setting time. If they can get the precedent set that you are going to require one of these COVID-19 vaccines to participate in society, and oh, by the way, you'll need one every single year, then it doesn't even matter this one particular vaccine this one time. It could be the accumulation of vaccines over the years, or they could start changing the formula somewhere down the road. And that is the real danger here, the precedent that is being set. Can you speak to that? Uh, Well, I think that sort of speaks to an ulterior motive, I sort of suspect here in in Oxford, uh, in in this case of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, which is news on the vaccine front. British regulators have identified 30 cases of rare blood clots events after administering 18.1 million doses of the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine so far. UK's Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency has also said that it had received no such reports of clotting events following the use of BioNTech and Pfizer vaccine. On March 18th, the UK Medicines Regulator said that there had been five cases of a rare brain blood clot among 11 million administered shots. This week, it put the count at 22 over reports of cerebral venous sinus thrombosis and eight reports of other clotting events associated with low blood platelets. The 30 cases are discovered out of a total of 18.1 million doses given the cerebral venous sinus thrombosis is an extremely rare brain clotting ailment. As investigations into reports of rare and sometimes severe blood clots continue, some countries are restricting the use of the AstraZeneca vaccine while others have resumed inoculations. Earlier in March, more than a dozen countries, including Germany, suspended their use of AstraZeneca's COVID-19 vaccine over the blood clot issue. Most of them restarted the vaccination with limitations after the European Medicines Agency said the benefits of the vaccine outweigh the risks of not inoculating people against COVID-19. It is important to note that the blood clotting cases among the recipients of AstraZeneca vaccines are majorly being discovered in European nations. In India, which is inoculating its massive population with the Oxford AstraZeneca coronavirus vaccine as well, no such case has been reported. More than 65 million doses of coronavirus vaccines have been administered across India so far. The vaccine was once hailed as another milestone in the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic, but has been dogged by questions since late last year. AstraZeneca jab has been authorized for use by dozens of countries, excluding the United States. But even if the AstraZeneca jab wins U.S. regulatory approval, the United States may not need the vaccine. That's the word from the nation's top infectious disease expert, Anthony Fauci. Fauci said the United States has enough contracts with other vaccine makers to vaccinate its entire population and possibly enough for booster shots in the fall. When you look more recently... The time will come, and it may not be far off, 
when quite different tendencies will come up at a Congress like the one held in 1912. And people will say, it is pathological for people to even think in terms of spirit and soul. Sound, in quotes, people will speak of nothing but the body. It will be considered a sign of illness for anyone to arrive at the idea of any such thing as a spirit or a soul. People who think like that will be considered to be sick and, you can be quite sure of it, a medicine will be found for this. At Constantinople the spirit was made non-existent. The soul will be made non-existent with the aid of a drug. Taking a, quote, sound point of view, close quote, people will invent a vaccine to influence the organism as early as possible, preferably as soon as it is born, so that this human body never even gets the idea that there is a soul and a spirit. The two philosophies of life will be in complete opposition. One movement will need to reflect how concepts and ideas may be developed to meet the reality of soul and spirit. The others, the heirs of modern materialism, will look for the vaccine to make the body, in quotes, healthy, that is, makes its constitution such that this body no longer talks of such rubbish as soul and spirit, but takes a sound view of the forces which live in engines and in chemistry, and that planets and suns arise from nebula in the cosmos. Materialistic physicians will be asked to drive the souls out of humanity. People who think with Playful ideas will help them to look ahead to the future are very much mistaken. We need serious, profound ideas to look ahead to the future. Anthroposophy is not a game, not just a theory. It is a task that must be faced for the sake of human evolution. The end of Lecture 5